Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the lecture. Today is 28th of July, 2020, and we have the lecture one of week five of the summer school for the course Reinforced Concrete Theory with the code of CIV 481. Today, as you see the color page, we will start the lecture and in next slide, we see the topics of the lectures. In today's lecture, we see a lot of things. We complete the second method that we introduced for the design of T-beams for positive, and also we see the points for negative moments, how to calculate the T-beams against negative moments at supports, for example, or at the cantilever supports. We see the design of L-beams. Uh, we also see the design of double reinforced beams. And we see some examples for all different uh, types of beams that we will see today. And we see the shear in reinforced concrete beams and some examples. Therefore, we have a lot of topics today. You remember, we saw one method for design of beam and second method, I started to give you the concepts and then now let's see one example here. Before is that, Let's see the review, the concepts that I introduced for second method that I called the traditional method for design of TVs. You know, I introduced one, I call that modern method for design of TVs. Now, the traditional method. In traditional method, as you see in the Figure T beam when we have compression in the web as well, and the location of neutral axis is under the uh, flange and you see the compression part also is under the uh, flange this is neutral axis we divide the AS that we have in tension part in two parts one per part AS W, it means AS for web, and the other part, ASF, or still we put in the part that we consider just only the flange part. Therefore, AS equals ASW plus ASF. And we say total, the section of T-beam equals one part that we have just compression at web and at the middle of the flange plus The other part, just we have compression only into wings or overhanging of the flanges here. 
and we calculate the moment in the first one due to tension at the steel we call that T1 or TF and compression at compression zone we call that C W why W because we consider just the web compression board this one you can write TW as well doesn't matter T1 or TW plus the effective moment when we have compression in the compression zone we call CF and T we have tension force at compression we call TF Why F? Because this part just we consider compression in flange. Therefore, if we find here MN for the entire section, MN equals, we can say MN W plus mn f when we have compression only at flange for the middle figure you remember we calculated this one before it is a simple rectangular section we can calculate that and mn f it was tw time ZW. What is ZW? ZW is from the centroid of compression zone up to centroid of tension zone. Therefore, ZW equals for us D minus A over 2. Therefore, MN equals T times ZW. And MNF is again T. Actually, this is T. Uh, we can say TW here. And the second one is TF. Times ZF. What is ZF? ZF is a lever arm for the third figure. For example, from the center of centroid of compression force to the centroid of tension force which I can show here this is that F and that F equals D minus H over HF over 2 the height of flange over 2 why because from the centroid of the compression zone up to the top, it is HF over 2. And total from top to the centroid of tensile steel, it was D, you remember. Therefore, it is D minus 
HF over 2. And MN totally equals MN W plus MN F. It means equals T W times Z W plus T Z times Z F. This is the concepts for finding the formulas that we had seen for the T beams. This is the formula that we found in the next slide. Therefore, compression force for the middle figure that we had compression only at web, as usual, it was the intensity of the stress block, 0.85 prime C times area of the compression zone, it was A times BW. And ZF, the compression force for the last or third figure that we had only compression at flange, it was intensity of stress, 0.85 prime C, times the area, which it was B minus BW times HF. I will show you this area on the figure. Let's get back to the figure that we had. Let me erase everything ink on the slide. Therefore, area on the compression is this part plus the other wing spot. Therefore, the total value of these two content quantities, you will see that equals B over two plus B over two from the other one is B minus H BW over two minus BW over two, it is BW. For it means that the total area for these two parts is B minus BW, summation of these two parts, times the height, which height? HF. Therefore, this is area under compression. <clears throat> Therefore, these are two compression force in two figures that we saw. And you remember that MN was the summation of MN1 plus MN2 or MNW plus MNF. And MNW, it was T or here uh, you can say C times Z. Z was D minus A over 2. And MNF, it was CF times ZF, it was D minus H over 2. Look, in design always we say T, but here we say C because we consider that they are equal and then we have compression and tension failure in the same time. It means that it's like balance case and then we calculate MN. It's clear we apply this formula when we have a T-beam, not rectangular beam. What does it mean? In this case, A should be greater than HF. What does it mean? Let me show you in the previous slide. Let me erase all ink on a slide. It means that you see here the 
operation zone if you consider the line the uh, um, line that we cut the web of the section if this is a as we consider a a should be greater than hf otherwise if a is less than hf the compression zone is in flange and we have a design of simply rectangular beam that we saw before but if a is greater than hf in this case we see one the real tipping when designed for real tip i hope you understood that very well Okay, let's continue. We have how many students? We have 22 students now in lecture in Google Meet. Okay, let's see one example now. Okay, in this example, we are repeating the example 5.2, but this time we use the traditional method and we use the value of A equals 8.19 inches that we found in that example. We don't repeat that. If I, for example, you have this uh, question in the exam, you should start and first find A and then continue. Therefore, here we don't repeat the calculation of A that we obtained previously. And the, uh, we use the alternate formulas or traditional formulas just we developed now. Reference is made to figure that is shown in the slide and the dimension of which were taken from figure 5.5 .5 that we had before. Therefore, we actually use initially the figure 5.5 .5 that we had before, and we use the A that we found before, and we generate a new figure that we see in this slide. You remember from that figure that D was 30 inches, BW was 14 inches, BF or B was 30 inches, and we calculated before A, it was 8.19. Now we calculate even you remember we calculated AC, AC, the total area that we had in, under compression, it was AC. We saw that AC is greater than AF, the area of flange. Therefore, neutral axis is located on the web, as we have here. And also, we found this height, 4.19, as you remember, by dividing this area in the web. to the EW, we find that height, that was 4.19.
And now we are continuing from here. We calculate CW, CF, and etc. Let's see next uh, slide. In this slide, as I told you, we apply the values for the formula of CW and CF. Compression force for the second figure that we have when the compression is only in web. And second one, the compression only on flange. We apply the values that we have. You remember that if prime C was given 4,000 PSI, which is equals 4 KSI, K is kips. And then the other values, we find CW in kips, and we find CF in kips as well. For finding phi, 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 doesn't matter, they are the same. Phi is original word, Greek word, phi is English. Therefore, for finding phi, you remember that we should find epsilon t, strain at c, and then we calculate that. For calculating uh, epsilon t, we need to calculate c first. For c, we apply the main definition that we had for a, c equals a over beta 1. Since or a prime C is 4,000, we can say beta 1 is 0 0.85. Pay attention, if it, beta 1 was greater than 4,000, uh, if a prime C was greater than 4,000 PSI, beta 1 was less than 0 0.85, and we should calculate that first. By dividing A, value over beta 1, we find C that, uh, values, and we apply in epsilon t, a strain at C. We find a strain something about, you see that it is about uh, 6 per thousand, which is greater than 8, 5 per thousand, it means the section is ductile and phi is 0, 0,9. Therefore, we can calculate a new ultimate design moment. And you remember that before calculating MU, which equals phi times MN, we calculate mn from the formula that we found. It was mnw plus mnf. Mn, m, mnw was cw times zw. And mnf, it was cf times zf. By applying the values, we will find MN equals 16,190 inch kips. We convert inch to foot. By dividing by 12, we find the value in foot kips. We apply MN in the Last equation, with applying the 0945 that we tested and we verified that, we find the values in put kips, and this is the result. Okay, let's, let me continue and go to the next slide. Everything that we saw here applied to two different methods, one modern and one traditional method. 
we it was for the T beams under the positive moment. For example, at the mid span of the beams, continuous beams or simply support beam. Now, if we have negative moment, the story is or the story is different for negative moment. We have negative moment where, when we have a continuous spin, or we have a cantilever, doesn't matter. You saw if we sketch the bending moment diagram, we have something like this, positive, uh, at the end is zero. Okay, consider here is con uh, continuous waves. Oh no, it's zero, that's okay. It starts from zero. No, it's negative here, it starts here. One support is fixed, the other is hinge, the middle are hinges. We have positive moment at mid spans. negative moments at supports. What does it mean? It means when we have at supports, let me change the color. Imagine that for, if this is the beam, and beam is under the for example, continuous distributed load that we have here is under the continuous load. You see that we have a deflected form. Let me again change the color. Deflected form here, it goes down. Goes down. I showed one exaggerated deflected form. The beam at the middle goes down at the supports bent like that. And you see the curvature at support and middle span are different. For example, you see that at middle span, the cracks are at bottom of section. Here, the crack at the bottom section at the middle span. Therefore, you see tension is bottom and compression top. But at support is inverse. The tensions are at top. Tension at top of the section. And cracks are there and bottom is under compression. And here you see that tension, we have cracks at top of the section. Therefore, if you see a T-beam, the T-section, and we check the condition at a support like this, You see, if we have, for example, neutral axis here, this time the compression is at the bottom, not at top. And we should still at the tension zone, which should put at top. This is different. What will happen when we have the compression at bottom and we neglect the tens we neglect the tensile concrete, this part which is at top, we have we should design a section which we have compression 
and tension like this. And the compression zone, which is important, is just at bottom. Therefore, we should design a section, rectangular section, with the width of BW. And in this time, you see, because we neglected the um, tension zone, we neglect the flanges. And just we calculate this rectangular beam. What is D? This is from the center of the, the center of the steel up to the bottom. Therefore, this is D this time. And we design this rectangular section for T beam under the negative moment. Pay attention. If we are at supports, or if we have at the support of a cantilever beam, they are the same. We use to design this one. And here again, there is two possibility. Either, as I let me show in the next mm, figure, the slide. Therefore, we have such a thing. It's possible neutral axis be at flange this time, or at web like here. But most probably we have at web, and we design, as I mentioned, section rectangular section with the width of PW and we consider just this part and we design the section when we design the section and we calculate AS we can distribute some part here and some part here for AS for us is the total steel that we have here Therefore, let me erase this neutral axis here. Yes, we designed this one. Therefore, it's most probably is like design of rectangular section that you see and the compression zone is at bottom of the section. Now let's see what is LB. <clears throat> when we have a section of a ceiling, and in ceiling we have beam, slab, beam, slab, and again beam. We saw that when we consider the middle one, the middle one, part of a slab works with the rectangular beam that they are casted in the same time, monolithically. Therefore, we have here a T-beam at the middle, as you see. But, let me change the color. For this part, that part of the slab works with the beam, 
because a slap is continued from one side, not from here. Therefore, this is L beam. And this is at the middle T beam. Again, we have another L beam here. What is the difference between T beam and L beam? T beam and L beam is for L beam we have a slab from one side. For in T beam we have a slab contribution from both sides. But the design are the same. Why? Because if you see the location of for example, CW or T, T or C, for both cases, they are similar, and the formula that we found, they are similar, application, they are similar. Just the difference is for the value of BF or B. Let me show you with another color. In the T beam, BF or B is from here to here. B e or BF. But for a, an L beam, this is B. Or the other one, B. Therefore, design of L-beam is exactly like design of T-beam with one difference. What is the difference? Difference is just B. Okay, how we calculate B? Do you remember for T-beam, we had three equations given by ACI code and we calculate and we consider the minimum value of them. Now, B is given again by ACI that we calculate from here. Therefore, for L beams, the effective width, which is B, of overhanging flange may not be larger than one twelfth of the stand length. Therefore, we have one B should be less than L over twelve. This is one of them. And second one is six times slab thickness. Therefore, B should also be less than six times HF. Which HF was Flange thickness or the thickness of a slab. And one half of the clearance stands. The last one, B, should be right here. Should be less than half of the span. Do you remember we say a spacing between distance span? No, a spacing between the beams. If it's S, it should be less than S over two. Therefore, the minimum of this three value, minimum of these values.
Give us me for Elvin. Therefore, the difference is only this one. The design is exactly the same. Imagine in exam, I gave you one Elvin. You will start design like T beam. Just first, when you calculate B, you calculate B, B from here. You apply these three values, not the value that I gave you. Okay. Let's go and see now the compression steel doubly reinforced condition. When we have doubly reinforced beam. When we have doubly reinforced beam, let me show in the next slide. In addition to the AS that we have, compression steel and uh, tension steel, we have compression steel as well. You say, why we don't need compression steel? Because concrete is strong enough against the compression. Why do you need compression steel? Because the steel is expensive, you should not use them too much. The answer is that sometimes there is limitation of height that is applied by, for example, architectures. They don't like, everyone doesn't like, don't like, doesn't like that see the beam uh, exposed and is very ugly. It should be covered and hidden in the false ceiling or in the ceiling. Therefore, they try to minimize the height of the beam. In that case, we have a lot of tension, tension more than allowable tension or allowable stress that we have here. We have stress. A stress in the compression zone is more than the allowable compression stress of concrete or even more than value that needed. For relaxing that stress, we use support. We reinforce them by reinforcing the steel which is have put on the compression zone. Therefore, we use doubly reinforced. We have intention and also in compression. Okay, the design of this one is exactly like beam. We say that the section of doubly reinforced equals a section just we have still in tension zone and we divide AS equals AS1 plus AS2. Therefore AS equals the summation of AS1 and AS2. And here we consider that we have concrete under compression we saw this one the design of this one from the beginning you know very well how to design this one that's shown in figure b plus another couple that just we have a steel on compression and a steel in tension zone you see the section is shown by dash line Therefore, it means that we don't consider any concrete. Just we have here the steel in compression and tension. We neglected this one. We don't have concrete here. Therefore, we say that MN equals MN1 that we have here in figure B plus MN2 that we have in figure C. 
you remember very clearly that ML1 was T1 times Z1. It is T is AS1 FY times Z1, it is D minus A over 2. For the last one, MN, you see we have one tension force here. We can say T2. And we have one compression zone here. Compression force, we can say C2. There were MN2 equals T two times Z two or when you have A S two equals A S prime you can say A S two times F Y times D minus D prime. Therefore for you Z is this height. This Z two. Let me erase this one, is not good. And sketch again. Therefore, this is Z2. Z2 is equal D minus D prime. What is D prime? D prime is from here, center of the compression C to top fiber of compression concrete. And you remember from this, this was E as well, from centroid to top. Therefore, Z is D minus D prime. Okay, we saw that MN equals MN1 plus MN2. We saw MN1 as we had a rectangular section, just only tens tensile reinforcement, and MN2 just steels, no con concrete. The couple between tensile steel and compressive steel. Now let's see the formulas that we derived in next slide. So from, from here, we see that MN, as I mentioned, has two parts, MN1 plus MN2. MN1 was T1 times Z1. MN2 was T2 times Z2. And when we calculate the ultimate design moment of the section MU. You remember that MU equals phi, the strength reduction factor, times MN, nominal resisting moment of the section. And MN, from here we apply in the formula, we find times phi times MN, this is the formula that we use for design of L-beam, double uh, reinforced beam. Therefore, one thing that we should carefully check, the assumption is that the tensile stress, tensile stress in the compression is Fy and is yielded. But what about the compression one? Sometimes it's not yielded. If it's yielded, we can say F prime S compression stress in the compression steel equals F Y. And we apply this equation. And in design first, we assume that we have yielding at both steels in tensile steel and in compression steel. But later you should check that. Is it right or not? Therefore, in the example 5.7 and 
eight in the straight. The calculation involved the determining the design strength of double reinforced sections. In uh, each of these problems, the strain a prime S in the compression steel is checked to determine whether or not it has yielded. It's very important. While the strain obtained the compression steel F prime C, F prime S is determined and the value of AS2 is computed with the following equation. In this equation. In addition to the thing that I mentioned, it's necessary to compute the strain at this tensile stress as well as we calculated before, epsilon, epsilon prime t, why? Because we should calculate phi. If epsilon prime t, epsilon t was greater than 0, 0, 0.5 or 4, 5, we say phi equal 9. Otherwise, we should calculate from the formula that we have. Therefore, this is the thing that we should consider. Therefore, initially, the stress in the compression steel is assumed to be yielded. Therefore, first we assume that the compression steel is yielded and its stress is Fy. Assuming that the horizontal force diagram is shown and it give with this assumption a prime C equals Fy, we find from the figure that we saw this one that T equals CW plus CF. Or F, no, we can say compression and tension. This is when we have only tensile steel and the other when we have only compression steel. All of them, these are T. We can say T equals T1 plus T2. And C equals, we can find from here, C is the only unknown. C is the location, the distance between location of meter axis up to top extreme fiber, we find from here. And you saw that when we have C, we can calculate epsilon prime s as well. How? Because with C, we calculated epsilon t for compression steel. How we calculate epsilon prime s, which is a strain at compression steel? Let me show in next slide. In this slide, you see the strain profile of the section and the stress profile. And you see that at the location of tensile stress, we had epsilon t. And we calculated before from the similarity of to triangle that we have here. Now, for the, the compression steel, we find epsilon S prime at the centroid of compression steel. What is this? If the compression steel from top fiber distance is D prime 
And you know that at extreme fiber of concrete, here at top, we consider a strain at concrete is three per thousand, 0 0.003. Therefore now we write, and you know that C from the neutral axis up to top. Now we see similarity of two triangles. One is the small one here, and the second one is the bigger one here. If you write similarity of this triangle, we can write 0 0.03, which is a strain epsilon u at concrete, over its height, which is c, equals the strain at compression steel, epsilon prime s, over height. Which height? Height is actually this height. What is this? This is c minus d prime. over C minus B prime. From here, we can find epsilon prime S, which equals 0 0.03 times C minus D prime over C that we see in a slide that I will show you here. Therefore, we found epsilon prime S from the figure that I showed you and we wrote here. Now there is one if. If the strain in compression steel, epsilon prime S, is greater than epsilon Y, what was epsilon Y? Epsilon Y was a strain at a steel at the moment that it is yielded. And from the Hooke's law is Fy over Es, which Fy is yield strength and ES is modulo of elasticity of steel. The assumption is valid and a prime S is at yield because first we assume that not only the tensile steel is yielded, we assume that the compression steel is yielded as well. Therefore, if epsilon prime s is greater than epsilon y, we had this condition, this if. But if not, If epsilon prime s is less than F, F, epsilon y, it means that the steel, compression steel is not yielded. The compression steel is not yielding and the value of C calculated above is not correct. A new equilibrium equation must be written that assumes F prime S is less than F Y. 
And then from writing this new equation, you remember that here we considered the value of this was epsilon prime s times es this is totally stress at compression steel time as it gives us the tension force when we apply the second one please take in mind keep in mind that the value of Modulo velocity in steel ES equals 29 million psi or 29,000 ksi kips per square inch. Okay, therefore, always we should be careful and consider two conditions. First, we assume the compression steel is also yielded, and we should verify that by calculating epsilon prime S and compare with epsilon Y. If it's not till that, we should recalculate everything C and Epsilon Y and compare with the yielded value. And apply the Hooke's law for the stress. Hello? I have lecture later after the one of the things. Okay? Okay. <clears throat> okay, sorry, yes. Let's uh, see one example. In this example, uh, we have one condition that epsilon prime s is not uh, greater than epsilon y. The Compression is not yielded, and in the other example, we see that it's yielded or inverse. Example 5.7 and 5.8 illustrate the compression of design component strengths of double reinforced beams. In the first of the, these examples, the compression still yields, while in the second, it doesn't. Let's see the first, the first example. 5.7. Determine the design moment capacity MU of the beam shown in the figure for which Fy is given 60,000 psi and F prime C 30,000 psi. Therefore, we see this section. In this section, you see that B is given. B is from centroid of tensile steel up to up. This is D. Therefore, D is not 27. You see that it is 27 minus 3. Therefore, D is for us 24. inches and d prime from the center of or centroid of compression is still up to top which it was given is given 2.5 inches now let's see the solution for writing the equilibrium equation, first we assume that f prime s equals f y. First we assume that the compression steel is yielded as well, like the tensile steel. We write t equals t1 plus t2, etc. The equation, the equilibrium that we have, or and then you can say T equals 
C1 plus C2 or totally T equals C. Compression is the force equals to the tension force. And here when we apply the values, you find the only unknown which is C. And we find this C. C is the distance between location of neutral axis up to the extreme fiber of concrete at top of the section. We find 8.54 inches. And from that we calculate A. A equals beta 1 times C. And we are lucky beta 1 is 0 0.85 because prime C is 4000 psi. If beta 1 was greater than 4000 psi, we should calculate beta 1, which was less than 0 0.85. Therefore, here, Now we're computing the strain in compression steel. Calculate epsilon prime Fs. Why? To check our assumption. What was the assumption? Assumption was the compression steel is yielded. We should verify that. Okay, we apply the formula that we found from the similarity of the the angles in a strain profile and we apply the values that we found C and D prime we find that epsilon prime S is 2.11 per thousand we calculate epsilon Y from the Hooke's law for the steel from the stress strain curve, if you see the strain, strain curve of the steel, it is like this. And you know that at the yielding we have a y here so if you consider the start of yielding point and you see what is the epsilon there epsilon here we call epsilon y Epsilon of yielding. That is, you know that when we have Hooke's law, we can calculate epsilon y from there by applying Fy over modulo elasticity of steel. We apply the value, we find it is 2.07 per thousand, which is less than epsilon y that we calculated therefore it means that therefore if s f prime s stress at the compression steel equals f y it means that the steel is yielded and the assumption was okay therefore assumption is okay in this example the compression steel is yielded okay we continue like that Uh, pay attention that in next example is not the case. It's another case. The compression steel is not yielded, and we have another solution. But for this example, we continue the solution here. First, we calculate AS2, the portion of a steel that we considered for the a section that just we have a steel, compression steel, 
and HST. And we find AS1 from the other figure. And we continue the calculation. AS2, when we calculate and apply the value, we find two square inches. And you know, because AS total is still at the inside side was equal the summation of AS1 plus AS2. We can say AS1 equals AS minus AS2. We had AS1. We found, we had AS, we found AS1, we AS2, we find AS1. This is AS2. This was AS was given to us in this section in the uh, figure of the section of the beam. We find AS1. Now we can calculate epsilon t, the strain at tensile stress. We have the formula from the similarity of the triangles in strain profile. We apply the values. We find it is 5.57 per thousand, which is greater than the target value that it was 0 0.05, 5 per thousand. Therefore, we can conclude that phi equals 0, 0.9. Otherwise, we calculate from the formula that we had for phi. Then the design moment strength, which is MU, and is equal phi, the reduction strength factor times mn the nominal moment in section we find phi times m n that we had you remember it was mn1 plus mn2 and it was t1 times z1 plus t2 times z2 we apply the values and we find MU equals 7,010 inch cubes because the input are, are inch up to now. We convert inch to foot by dividing by 12 and we find the result in foot cubes. And this is the output and the result that we search for it. Pay attention, in this example, the assumption was correct. What was the assumption? Assumption first, it was the compression steel is yielded. But in, in next ex example, we see now the assumption is not correct and we should apply the Hooke's law to calculate the strain and stress. stress. Okay, example 5.8. Compute the design moment strength of section shown in the figure when Fy is given 60,000 psi and F prime S, F prime C equals 4,000 psi. Pay attention when F prime C equals 4,000 psi, we are relaxed because beta 1 is 0 0.85. Otherwise, we should calculate beta 1. The section B is given 14 inches. Total height is 27 inches. And again, D is 27 minus 3 minus concrete cover. D equals 24 inches.
the value of a prime s is given then num four number 10 and we find a s from table and compression st two number seven we find a prime s from table and d prime is given 2.5 inches now let's see the solution as the first step of the solution again for writing the equilibrium equation we first we assume that the compression steel is yielded and we assume that a prime s equals f y this assumption like any other assumption should be verified how we calculate a strain at compression st and compare with epsilon y then we write t equals c and c has two parts c1 and c2 we apply the values there is only one unknown in the equation that is c a small c or lowercase c is the distance between the location of the neutral axis up to the top of the section or up to the extreme compression fiber of concrete define c equals 5.72 inches then we calculate a by applying the beta 1 was 0 0.85 why because a prime c was 4000 psi not greater than that one otherwise we should calculate beta 1 from formula and then we find a which is 4.86 inches and now we are checking our assumption what was the assumption? Assumption is whether the compression steel is yielded or not. How we verify the assumption? By calculating a strain at compression steel, which is epsilon prime s, from the equation that we found from the similarity of two. The angles in the diagram of strain <laughs> Sorry. Excuse me, Professor, I have a question. Yes, you have any question? Yeah, uh, please, how did you get to that one? Pardon, could you please, I didn't hear you. Um, I said, uh, how did you get beta one, B1? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Beta 1, if you go to the previous lectures, we found beta 1 from uh, one equation that was given. Beta 1 is given one equation by the ACI code. Actually, it's one equation that you will find. It is interpolation between 4000 and the other prime S that we have. Therefore, please check the produce the lectures that we have. All right, so like it's same for everything, right? We use 0 0.85 for it. 0 0.85 is when we have a prime C equals to 4,000 PSI or less than that. One oh. If uh, a prime C is over 4,000 PSI, we should apply that equation that we have. All right, thank you. You're welcome. Therefore, here, very good question, because uh, last final exam I gave, for example, beta, uh, a prime C equals 4,500, and it, it is not 0 0.85, you should calculate that. Good question. Therefore, here, we calculate epsilon prime S for verifying the assumptions. We apply the values, and we find this is 0 0.1 point, uh, 
it's 1.069 per thousand. When we calculate epsilon y from Hooke's law, you see epsilon y is 2.77 per thousand, which is greater than epsilon prime s that we found here. It means that a strain at compression C is low, is lower than yielding a strain. Therefore, the assumption that we said the compression seal is yielded is wrong. Therefore, we don't have, they are not equal. Therefore, this assumption was wrong. Therefore, we cannot apply instead of a prime s the value of y what we should do we should use the hooks law as we saw before in next slide you see that when we apply t equals c plus c1 and for c2 we consider this one that found from the Hooke's law. This is actually a prime S. This is not a Y. And, and you know, a prime C from Hooke's law, it is epsilon prime s the strain at a steel compression steel times modulo of elasticity es therefore we have here a prime s we apply the values again you see that here there is the only unknown is a small or lowercase c that we find from this equation c equals six inches and then we calculate a it is 5.1 inches. Then we apply C in epsilon prime S, C values, and we find epsilon prime S 1.75 per thousand, which is less than epsilon Y that we found in previous slide, 2.7 per thousand. Therefore, it means that the compression steel is not yielded and we should apply a prime S, not a Y in the equations. We calculate a prime S and we find 50.75 KSI. I compare this example for previous example. In the previous example, the assumption was right. The compression steel was yielded. And we applied in a set of f prime s f y, and f y was sixty thousand. But here now, the assumption was wrong. The compression is not yielded. Therefore, we should calculate f prime s stress at the compression steel. We did that. We found a little different. It's fifty guess i, not sixty. Okay. Then we calculate AS2 as we had before, AS1, and we calculate epsilon T to find Y values. Epsilon AS2 we calculate, and you know that AS1 is the difference between AS, the total steel, in, in tension minus is to the second part when we had just compression and the 
inside steel. We apply the values. We find S2. And we go by having C, calculate epsilon T. We saw this is 0 0.9 per thousand, which is greater than 0 0.5 per thousand. Therefore, file, the section is ductile and file is 0 0.9. We have five, we can calculate MU now. In this slide, we calculate MU. The ultimate capacity of moment of section, which is phi times MN. Phi was a strength reduction factor, and MN was nominal moment of the section. We apply the values that we had before. By application of the values, we find MU equals 5,850, yes, 5,863 inch kips, converting inch to foot by dividing by 12. We find the value of MU in foot kips. That's all. The question is answered. Now we wanted, we finished the flexural analysis and applying the bending moment. Now we see another category which is shear. The nature of shear and its action is different from the bending in the section and in overall length of the beam. Therefore, we have, if we have a beam which its length is long enough, the failure is due to flexural effect, due to bending. But if, if we have a short length beam that we call deep beam, the failure may be due to the shear only. And for different lengths, there is two effects, bending and shear, and the location are different. Let's see what we have from the past, from the strength of material, for example. From the strength of material, you remember that we had two formulas, one for bending, it was stress due to bending moment, it was sigma or F equals MC over I. And the other is shear stress, small v, which is capital V is shear force times Q over IB. And you remember that Q was static moments or first moment in the section, I was moment of inertia, and B is the width of the beam. And you see that for T beams, for L beams, or beams sections different from rectangular beam, we use BW, the web B, because the maximum stress is at the web, is not at the flange. Okay, let's see. If you have a simple beam, you see that for design of the reinforcement, the middle span, for example, you see that the maximum moment was at the middle of a span, at middle span, but shear there is zero. It's lucky, a shear and moment the maximum are not in the one place. Inverse, at support, we have maximum shear at support, but the moment is zero. Very nice. If maximum was 
on the maximum point for bending and shear, it was that. Now they are different. One is zero, the other is maximum. And the location at the mid span or at support are different. And the other location between this one, there is combination of these two effects. For example, here we have come uh, to, uh, shear and also we have moment. Therefore, we have two types of reinforcement. We have for bending moment, the longitudinal steel, and also we have steel ups for shear. Now let's see the location of shear at a section. You remember that if you have a section of a rectangular beam, the shear diagram is a parabolic diagram that the maximum shear is at the middle to max or V max. And uh, at the top and bottom is zero. Therefore, if you see the location of maximum, for example, a shear and compression at the middle span, maximum is at top and maximum at bottom, compression and tension. But shear here is zero at maximum, as um, top and bottom. And maximum is at the middle. Therefore, here we see the formula for principal stress. What is the principal stress? Principal stress is the stress at any point. You will see later in the, for example, elasticity course, or you have seen before in the strength of material. At any point, we have the combination of shear and also the bending stress. FP FP is principal stress, F is flexural stress due to bending, and V is shear stress at the section. Let me show you three cases in a section. If you see a beam here and we get one element of at top, one element at bottom and one element at the neutral axis, it's clear at top we don't have shear, just we have for example, for cantilever, compression, uh, tension. It's cantilever, pay attention. It's not a, for example, simple support beam. It's a cantilever. And at bottom, we had just uh, compression. Or inverse. You can see that depends on the location. Here, Compression at bottom, tension at top. And here, just we calculate the flexural stress M times Y over I. For the bottom, the same. 
but at the location of neutral axis, there is not any flexural stress, just we have shear stress. And this is the shear force times a static moment over I moment of inertia times B. And we show that shear stress is vertical and because of equilibrium, it's horizontal as well. It's a couple. For the other side, there is horizontal and also the vertical. Why we had horizontal and vertical? Because if you get one moment at this corner, at the point of the element, if there is not horizontal and vertical, we have rotation. We have equilibrium because we have vertical and also we have horizontal. Therefore, the nature of the shear is horizontal in the section and in uh, uh, vertical as well. Okay, let's get back to the equation. Therefore, this equation gives also the angle between the principal stress and the longitudinal uh, section of the beam. This is one element that we had over that the flexural stress we had the shear stress and imagine that uh, we had principal stress fp which is combination of F and uh, V and it has one angle alpha with longitudinal direction of the beam. We had this formula for alpha. You saw it's very interesting when we have F P, for example, in this direction, principal stress, the cracks are perpendicular to that one. These are the cracks. Therefore, we can find the location of the cracks and the direction of that. If you apply this formula, you see that when V is zero at the middle, alpha is zero as well. It means at the middle of the span, we have a simple beam. At the middle of the span, V equals zero. From this formula, we see that alpha is zero as well. From this formula. Therefore, when alpha is zero, it means that principal stress is horizontal. This is FP. Principal stress is horizontal and we saw the cracks are perpendicular to the principal stress. Therefore, the cracks here are vertical. The crack are vertical, we put the reinforcement horizontally here. 
But what will happen at support? At support, you see that f is zero. At support, f is zero. At support. F is zero, when F is zero from the formula, you see tangent to alpha equals tangent zero. Tangent, tangent 90, because infinity. Tangent to alpha equals tangent 90 degrees, because it's infinity. Alpha is 45 degrees. In this case, alpha is 45 degrees. Forty-five degrees. What does it mean? It means that Fp equals here in forty-five degrees. What is FP? FP is principal stress. And the cracks are in perpendicular to that one here. Therefore, cracks are 45 degrees in the other direction. And here, the cracks also, they are like this, 45 degrees. Because of that, we should put here the steels perpendicular to that one. The steel bar should be perpendicular to the cracks. A steel bar should be, uh, cracks are, uh, sorry, in the other side is like here. The steel bar should be perpendicular to that one. Therefore, it give us, let me check and give you another section. If there is section here, And we had one simply support. At the middle span, the crack was vertical. We put a steel perpendicular to that one. At the support, the crack are 45 degrees. We should put perpendicular to that one like this. And here it is at 40, the cracks are at 45 degrees. It still should be perpendicular to that one, like this. Therefore, you see that at the middle we have a steel for bending. This is a steel for bending. At the support, these are still for shear stress. This is the fourth. But as I mentioned, let me go to the next slide and come back. We have crack at the middle here, it's clear. It is, uh, still is horizontal. But at the support, it is inclined. Or we can put a stirrups vertical. You say why vertical? It should be perpendicular to the cracks. Yes, but the components of the vertical projected in the direction perpendicular to the cracks has some effects. And vertical is easier. These are the normal stirrups. Therefore, we ha can have two types of stirrups. One is vertical. The other may be, for example, uh, one is vertical stirrups. The other may be inclined. 
both of them are still for shear. Let's see the when we have shear reinforcement and that are vertical, we use stirrups like here or here or some others hooks like this or combination of them. These are the types. We come back to this one. Therefore, for calculating the shear strength of concrete, we consider that we show the capital V for shear force. Nominal shear force in this section is nominal shear force in compression or concrete plus nom nominal shear force due to steel, stirrups. It has two parts. And you know that always with the normal, uh, with the nominal value and the ultimate value, there is one phi. We can say VU ultimate shear force equals phi times uh, VC plus phi times VS. VC is the contribution of concrete in shear and VS is con mm, contribution of stirrups or shear stresses, shear reinforcement in the shear forces. Okay, what about the VC? VC is clear. VC is given by the code, has a capacity for any section, is clear. Depends on the D, B or BW, a prime C, and lambda. What is lambda? Lambda is one when we have normal weight concrete. A prime C, you know, B and uh, D is there. You say why B, BW, not B? Because for T beams, I beams, etc., we have two B, one B at web, which that's important for shear. We have maximum shear at web, and the other at flange, that is not very important. Therefore, we use BW here. Be careful. And we saw this slide. Here it shows the stirrups vertical. And you see the cracks direction. Is cover that one. And the effective of the bending reinforcement or flexural reinforcement and shear reinforcement perform something like a truss for us. Yes, we can use the vertical stirrups for shear at supports, especially when we have uh, shear force, important shear force, or we can use oblique shear reinforcement like this that we call them bent up bars. Both of them is okay. This one or this one, we can use them. Depends on the practice and easy working with the workers, etc. There are two types we have. One vertical stirrups. The other one is bent up bars 
that they are inclined. The first one was vertical. Okay, I think time's up. I am thankful that uh, you are two hours without interruption, without break. You followed me in the lecture. And I think let's get a stop here and we continue after midterm exam. You remember that Thursday we have midterm exam and you should prepare for that up to before the share. From the beginning up to the before the share is included in midterm exam. Please prepare for that one. We we'll stop here and let me, do you have any uh, question or not? If you have any question, we have 28 students in that lecture. Therefore, they have, thank you, Professor. Okay, therefore, it means that you are tired and you get rest. Thank you very much. I stop recording in Google Meet, but what I stay at the user and here to answer your question if you have any thought. But I see there is one question. Let me watch that. The, There is one question. If it's not about exam, it's better. When is the final? Final is next week. Final exam is next week. Okay. Thank you very much. I stop here. Another question. Prof, when it will be? I am asking about time on Tuesday. Tuesday exam is at the lecture time. Is at 5 o'clock. Please uh, bring with you ID card. You should show me ID card. And the camera should be uh, open. And I should, you should uh, survey and check, investigate your situation. And prepare some papers. And you write them and get photo and uh, make a file and upload in the user. I will explain the example. OK, thank you very much. Uh, Yusuf asked, Prof, it is this lecture, last lecture? No, we have one lecture in next week. And one final exam in next week. Thank you very much. Therefore, I stop the recording and I continue answering your question in the USM and also in Google Meet, but not recording. Thank you very much. And I stop recording.